At the Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., tourists gaze at the wonders of the natural world. They are unaware that a few feet away, a storage area holds the unnatural work of a vicious killer. Police in Fairfax County, Virginia, have called on forensic scientist Doug Owsley to help identify the victim of a brutal homicide. The body has decomposed. Only a skeleton remains. Owsley has determined that the victim was a female from 27 to 34 years old. She died from repeated stab wounds. But who is she and where did she come from? When you're, when you're working with police cases and working on problems of human identification, often when the remains come into the laboratory or when you're involved in the recovery, the identification follows very quickly. There's someone that's missing. There are records that can be obtained, dental records or medical records that you can compare against, and you can get that person identified within a very short period of time. But uh, police well, in Fairfax do, County have found no immediate links to a missing person. What's your phone number? Owsley will need every piece of evidence he can find to produce a life history of the victim, to be matched, hopefully, with someone who disappeared as many as six years before. Personal effects found with the victim are minimal. An inexpensive hair clip, a hair pick. Her blue jeans had rotted away. Her synthetic underwear remained. Lightweight sandals indicate that the crime was committed in warm weather. Her hair was a light brown color, as, as determined from analysis of hair found at the, at, the, at the site. We know that her fingernails were painted from fingernails that were recovered at the site. Uh, it was a, a dark, glossy pink in color. So there's a lot of details. On the earrings found near the body is a fragment of human tissue. The metal of the earring had protected it from bacterial decay. The earrings are included in sketches distributed nationwide. Slowly, painfully, the haunting details of the victim's life are coming into focus. In the spinal column are signs of trauma. Depressions in the vertebra are evidence that the discs between the vertebrae have herniated. The victim may have held a job that required heavy lifting. She'd once taken care of her teeth, but in the last years of her life had allowed them to decay. She had fillings on the front teeth to maintain her appearance, but five of her molars are missing. Black stains on the teeth are evidence the victim was probably a smoker. Overall, the, the impression that you would have, but it's an impression based not only on the dentition, but perhaps some of the things found with it, it, it would suggest that it was an individual that, that did not have a lot of money, that uh, fairly, fairly limited financial resources. The information gleaned by Owsley is passed on to the Fairfax County Police Department, where Detective Bruce Guth heads the homicide branch. In, in our jurisdiction, uh, many of the murders are um, committed by people who know, know the victim. In the normal case, once the victim yeah, is known, the police will talk to neighbors and relatives about the victim's lifestyle, who her friends were, and her enemies. A chain of evidence often will lead to the guilty party. In this case, we don't know the identity, so it makes it difficult to to uh, really go much further till we know who it is. Detail by detail, Fairfax County Police re-examine the evidence found at the scene. A sketch of what the victim may have looked like is distributed to police across the country, along with other details of the case. Even though this case is two years old, I'm still actively pursuing leads that have occurred. I receive inquiries approximately two to three a month. Uh, just recently, I received one from Philadelphia, New York City, and Ohio. Uh, 
Despite the continuing efforts of the Fairfax County Police, there is no matchup of the murder victim with a missing person. To facilitate the search for the victim's identity, Doug Owsley provides data for a second composite sketch using an FBI computer program. When you, when you look at a skull and you're trying to assess what this individual looked like, the basic form is going to be defined by the skull itself. In relation to that, then you take into consideration the clothing that's found, for instance, because the clothing helps you, you gain a, an idea as to the size, the weight of the individual, for instance. Starting with an image of the skull, the computer adds successive layers of detail. Markers indicate the probable thickness of facial tissue. The measurements are based on population studies of similar age and gender. Hair found at the scene, along with the plastic hair clip and hair pick, suggest a possible hairstyle. The victim had an overbite, a gap in her front teeth, and a cosmetic filling. Since these features would have been visible in life, the victim is shown smiling in the final illustration. But despite the pains taken to create a lifelike image, there is still no response when the image is published nationwide. Part of the problem, the police are still unsure when the murder occurred. When discovered in 1993, the bones had been dry the flesh had long since rotted away. You'd have to say that it would be at least a year and a half before that that this could have happened. But in reality, I think it could extend back further in time. And so if we take the, the maximum range, one of the things found in a pocket was a quarter that dates to 1980. So looking at the time frame, we're, we're in terms of the extremes, probably talking between 1991 and 1980. More than two years have passed since the discovery of a female body in the Virginia countryside near Washington, D.C. Fairfax County investigators, including detectives Jerry Farrell and Dennis Wilson, have sent out extensive information on the case, including descriptions of the victim, dental charts, and a description of some, but not all, of the wounds discovered by forensic expert Doug Owsley. Persons have been known to confess crimes they did not commit, having learned the details of the crime from public sources. By withholding certain information, the police can be sure when a confession is fabricated or genuine. Right, this is going to be the cut, right? Far from having a confession, police in Fairfax County, after two years of searching missing person files, still do not know who the victim is. Even today, we think a lot about her and, and are, are hoping that through the facial reproductions that have been done, that someone might be able to recognize her, might be able to contact the police and offer new insights, because this is, this is somebody that we need to get identified and we certainly need to, to, in order to hopefully prevent this from happening again, find out who did this. We've sent hundreds of leads out, hundreds of posters. Uh, we're going to probably revise this again at least once or twice a year. We try to cover it on the TV stations, the media. Uh, we try to get the uh, newspapers interested to run the picture. We run not only the artist renditions, but we also run pictures of the clothing. Uh, this is no way a case that's just sitting on a shelf and nothing being done. With a growing population and more and more people on the move, many crimes may never be solved. Victims like the one found in Fairfax County, her friends and relatives unaware of her death, may remain unidentified, her killer free to kill again.